Mantor Ministries presents the Mantor Guy Podcast. We may talk about football. We could mention bacon. We might reference Rocky movies. We'll probably discuss the Mantor conferences, but we'll definitely talk about how to grow in our walk with God. Here's your host, the Mantor Guy, Jamie Holden. Hey guys, welcome back to the Mantor Guy Podcast. Jamie Holden here once again with you. Thank you so much for joining us and giving us your time this week to listen. On this week's podcast, we're going to be bringing you Pastor Walt Smith's workshop message from the 2022 North Central PA Mantor. Pastor Walt taught the need to ride or die for biblical manhood, and we feel this is such an important topic in the world we live in today that we wanted to bring you this fabulous message from Pastor Walt, who really did a great job with this subject. So guys, I know you're going to enjoy this message from our 2022 North Central PA Mentor. My assignment today is just to share with you guys the ride and die type of thing, uh, concept with uh, biblical manhood in an ever changing culture and we have a ever changing culture that we look around and I believe uh, Brad Price Ethan's dad shared that in the first session so societal views are devaluating us like never before so we're going to try to get started here and by doing so we got to put the key in the ignition and uh get things started, okay? So, those are some of my old cars right there. So, uh, didn't start. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day, and right now I pray, Lord, that you'll just, through your Holy Spirit, speak to us and speak to us through the Word. In Jesus' name, amen. We did get it started. Good. And that a great sound? Ride and die it originally had the concept of motorcycles. There you go, man. Got the one out here. Um, even with cars and what have you. Okay, we're finished with that, all right? Turn it off for now. That was my first car, 1950 Buick. Heavy as a tank, man. Deuteronomy 23. I found this verse the other day. Maybe some of you guys have read it before, but uh, I said ouch on this. As I was preparing this lesson, it says, No one who is emasculated or has his male organ cut off may enter the assembly of the Lord. Wow, that's a little personal, isn't it, huh? Chop, chop. chop. Yes. Uh, emasculated carries with it the idea of being deprived. Uh, uh, and what society is trying to do is try to deprive us of the value that we are as men. And uh, whether they are literally or uh, perhaps in a different fashion, uh, removing our testicles, um, it's happening. And we do need to be men of the word. We do need to be men of biblical value. Uh, we don't like to address sexual topics in the church. Uh, I know Brad touched on pornography in the first service, and it seems like we're deluged. We go to a men's conference, and they're always talking about that, talking about it. And we don't like to deal with it. We've got to deal with it. He said it. So I'm not going to reiterate some of what he said, but it's nothing new. And the Bible says there's nothing new under the sun. You go back to the Old Testament scriptures, and you will find that one of the reasons that the Lord wanted His people to be separate, and even in Canaan, the promised land, that there were so many other uh, pagan cultures that lived in that land, God wanted them separate, not because He was mean, but because He loved His people. And He wanted to protect them, protect them from sexual disease, protect them from from all sorts of perverted and perverse uh, concepts. But we look in our world, and it's the same today. I mean, we, we in the church, men in the church, are being affected because of what's happening in the world. And where do we stand? How do we deal with that? And we're going to be in the book of Daniel chapter 1 today. And 
God says that there's so many abominations uh, that come in through paganism. And like I said, there's nothing new in the world, nothing new at all. And we've got to find our place on where we're going to stand firm and where we're going to stand upon God's Word. Uh, I've got a guy for you here I want you to listen to, just about two minutes. He's the Lieutenant Governor of no the state of North Carolina. I used to live there, first church I pastored. Before Mifflinburg, John knows me from Mifflinburg. John's a good guy. Uh, but my first church when I got out of college was in Mifflinburg. I mean, it was in uh, Valdez, North Carolina, just north of Charlotte. This guy is now the lieutenant governor. And he made this statement in this speech about two minutes long, just a couple months ago. And he is being so reviled right now, and they're calling for his recall. And uh, you just need to listen to his words. I, I think you'll find them uh, fascinating. And only he can say it this way. Here's something else I'm not supposed to say. Ain't but two genders. <laughs> <laughs> That's him up there on the left. Two genders. Ain't nothing but men and women. And I can already see WRL out there. They got their licking and pissing around. Trying to write fierce as they can. Get every word in this here. Get every word in this. You can go to the doctor and get cut up. You can go down to the dress shop and get made up. You can go down there and get drugged up. But at the end of the day, you were just a drugged up, dressed up, made up, cut up, man or woman. You ain't changed what God put in you, that DNA. You can't transcend God's creation. I don't care how hard you try. The transgender movement in this country, if there's a movement in this country that is demonic and that is full of anti the spirit of antichrist, it is the transgender movement. It's time for grown-ups and time for Christians to start standing up and being unafraid to tell the truth. Come after me if you want to. I don't care. You want my head? Here it is right here. Come on, come get it. I don't care because it's time for us to stand up. And I'm not afraid to stand up and tell the truth about that issue. We're dragging our kids down into the pit of hell, trying to teach them that mess in our schools. Tell you like this, that ain't got no place at no school. Two plus two don't equal transgender. It equals four. You need to get back to teaching them how to read instead of teaching them how to go to hell. Yeah, I said it and I mean it. Is that good or what? Remember his name, Mark Robinson. You might, might hear more of him in the days to come. But he's true, right? He's a good Baptist brother. I'm saying he, he can shout down some of us Assembly of God boys like nothing. But he's, he's right. To question the concept of gender is to challenge the way God's made us. And he has made us with two genders, uh, male and female. Genesis says that. We either believe the book or we don't. But culture, society, is saying now we have to accept all these other genders. I did some research about a week ago, knowing I was going to teach this, I found out that about... Six, eight years ago, they said Washington, some of the uh, societies there and some of the departments there said there was about 52 genders. I said, what? I, I, I looked last week, and as of last week, one of the human services of our, of our government says there's 112 genders. And I copied off the list, and it's crazy. In our county, in Berkeley County, now, we found out just in the last week this is false, but it's happening in our county. I live in West Virginia, right below Hagerstown, Maryland, uh, retired there. But in Berkeley County, as well as some counties in the Midwest, in Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Iowa, and there's some other states, uh, this, I, I think it was some students that did this, uh, 
the rumor started on Facebook and social media that the school district was putting cat litter boxes in the bathrooms because some of the students were identifying as furry, furry animals. Now, supposedly that is just fake news. And I think it was some kids kind of playing with the school administrations because they've studied it out in the Midwest. Our county has put a debunk on it. But uh, that's, how, that's how crazy we've become in our culture. How do we handle that? How do we handle when a student comes in? If any of you are teaching leaders in the church, how do you handle when a student comes in to your class, into your church, and begins to question, ask, how do you do that with your son or daughter, your grandkids? Hmm? How do we deal with this? How, how do we handle this? So looking at Daniel chapter 1 is where I really want to start today. So we're in Daniel chapter 1, and we're going to read the first uh, couple of verses there. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. So here's the carrying away of God's people into captivity and into Babylon. With some of the articles of the house of God, he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God, and he brought the articles of the treasure of his God. Then the king instructed Ashpenaz. Now we're going to talk about this guy a little bit more. Ashpenaz the master of his eunuchs. Again, here's, a guy, here's men. It's not just one. It says, it's plural, eunuchs. They've been emasculated. They've been, uh, their gender, I mean, they, they no longer can produce. They're, they're uh, uh, servicing there the kings and the, the royal people in the palace. So he instructs Ashpenaz, the master of the eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles, young men in whom there is no blesh, uh, blemish. So what are they going to try to do? They're going to try to change these Jewish captives that they've just taken from Jerusalem. They're going to try to, to uh, uh, reform them into what they want and change their identity. This is what our culture is doing to us. And they want some of the very best people. They said, young men in whom there was no blemish, but good looking. Kind of like John Ebby and me here today, you know. We're good. Well, okay. Tim too. We got to, Tim really helped me out here before the, the so we got to include Tim. Good looking guys like us, okay. Gifted at all wisdom. Like Jeff back there. I could just see he's so quiet and just Wisdom is oozing out of those gray hair. Um, possessing knowledge and quick to understand. I can see Ben is there. Didn't get your name, brother. Roland. What? Roland. Roland. That's a great name. Quick to understand who had ability. Had ability to serve in the king's palace. And whom... They might teach the language and the literature of the Chaldeans. The king appointed for them a daily provision of the king's delicacies, of the wine which he drank, three years of training for them. So these, these that are being set aside, that they're going to, we use the term indoctrinate, it's going to be a three-year time frame. So that the end of the time they might serve before the king. Now, from among those are the sons of Judah were Daniel... Hananiah, Mishael, and that can be pronounced a couple different ways, and Azariah. They are better known as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now these are their Jewish names, and I'm not sure why we've learned over the years uh, in Sunday school and in church, you know, it's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Those are the Babylonian names, and I, I'm not saying one way or the other. I'm not saying that one's right, one's wrong. I'm not saying that, but I just have thought it odd all these years. Especially when we don't know Daniel by his. Yeah, because Daniel was Belteshazzar. That was, and it seems, that, but Daniel's writing this thing. So, you know, go figure. Good point, Dan, uh, Tim. So to them, the chief of the eunuchs 
gave names. He gave to Daniel the name of Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, uh, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. And there's, uh, spelling is a little different as you go from one to the other. But here's what I want us to hit on today. The first point of what we face in this culture that's trying to change us. Um, culture always tries to rename us or re-identify us. Maybe not change our name, perhaps, but try to get us to look at ourselves far from what God has designed and his destiny. Uh, finding out, you know, who we are. And I know as young men, I know as teenagers, I mean, um, my mom was a great mom. Um, she, you know my mom, you know, Mary Smith. And a great mom growing up. His dad pastored my home church years after I left the flock there and got out because I'm the old guy now. But my mom drugged me to, I mean, I had a drug problem from early on. She drugged me to church. And my mom, I mean, in those days you had Sunday school and Sunday morning worship and then you had Sunday night and then you had some kind of women's meeting on Tuesday night and then Wednesday night and then my mom was the missionary secretary for 30 some years. She was taking me out every night. Now, my dad did not know the Lord till about three months before he died in 1975. But all through that, I'm being drugged to church. And I'm glad now that she did because there was, there was that concept that I, I, I knew that I was loved by God. Now, again, right or wrong, I kind of deviated from some things in my life when I became a teenager. Came back to the Lord about when I was about 18 or 19 years of age. But I realized that culture, wanting to be with the in crowd, uh, popular, and I was never really popular, I just realized that it was the enemy's way of just trying to steal from me who God wanted me to be. Now, I've lived 68 years on this planet, and I'm still struggling with things. I'm still trying to figure out who I am, but I kind of know now who I am, and I'm, I'm not struggling. It really doesn't matter whether you like me or not, you know? But years ago, it was that way, and we lived so much on the popular. Somebody writes something on social media against us, and man, it gets us all better. Come on, man. You know, it's the enemy's way to try to get in and to emasculate us. If we're to have an impact on our culture, and I think we're supposed to have an impact on our culture, uh, rather than the culture having an impact on us, uh, which are we going to be, the thermostat or the thermometer? What's the difference between a thermostat and a thermometer? Open discussion. It moves. What's a thermostat do? Thermostat controls the thermometer. Ah, yes. Constant. Constant. Yeah. It's like the old guy from West Virginia. I mean, he went in and his buddy had air conditioning. He says, how do you have air conditioning? Oh, that thing over there on the wall. And I just kind of turn it up and he heard the air conditioning come on. He says, where do you get one of those? Down at True Value. The old West Virginia hillbilly, he went down to, West, to the True Value, brought it back, nailed it up on his wall and turned it and there's nothing happened, right? Because it's just a thermometer without being hooked all to the apparatus that brings in the cool air. We have an opportunity to not reflect the culture, but to impact. How can we do that? Open discussion. How, how, how can we, as God's men, how do we impact our culture? Consistency in character and in, in how we act. Our actions need to be consistent with who we are in Christ. I like that. Consistent. Somebody else. Staying grounded in the word that's immovable. Wow, that's good. Mm -hmm. well, you've already alluded to not caring what other people think about you. Yeah.
And, it, and it's difficult because we all want to be liked. That's why we all combed our hair today and brushed our teeth if we have any teeth, right? We, 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 we dressed appropriately. Everybody's got jeans on. Some nice slacks back there, guys. Proud of you guys. Proud of you back there. But, you know, we get to the place where it really doesn't matter whether someone else agrees with me or not. You know, uh, I think it was Ben said, we're grounded in the Word. Um, how, is, how is the culture of today, with all the different genders they say there are, with this woke-ism that's out there, how is culture eroding the church? Or is it? And I mean, I mean the church at large, not your specific, but the church at large. It pushes against the values of, of the church and of our human character, who we are. It consistently, like an example is... Uh, you know, a person in our church, his uh, sister wanted to become a man, so she changed her name. And he, who was on the worship team, you know, started saying that she had the right to do this and that we were, you know, what's the word, homosexual friendly or whatever word you want to put in there. And, and we lost him as a member. But, you know, he needed to be off. When he, when he took that stand, he no longer... You know, wow. stood for biblical values, and he's, you know, he was basically defending his sister at the cost of losing, in my opinion, his defense of God and his standing with God. Wow. I wow. think that's just one example. That's a great example. I mean, a sad example, but yeah. it's a great example. Somebody else. Tim. I think there's a, with a lot of people that work in, the, in our area, in our church, I know there's lots of people that work in school districts and different things like that or uh, prison systems and different things like that where the, the government who has these multiple supposed genders and classes and they teach and whatever to that and, and it may not be a you believe it and they say we don't believe it, we don't do this, but they're kind of holding some of your beliefs and values at bay saying well you can't say this or you can't say this isn't not that you have to necessarily push it or whatever, but then now you're not those little tiny things here and there. You don't push against this a little bit. You don't push against that for threat of something. And then when you don't push against that little thing, then you're getting a little bit more and you can't push against that. And you just get always, you're just slowly getting pushed back more and more and more to the point where you've got to almost at some point make a decision. Am I going to, now you're speaking out against it because it's all those little things versus being able to do those little things. To a degree, it's a very tough predicament you're in. What can you actually say? Is that worth losing your job over or there you go. the system? There and, you go. And not all of it right away is, but at some point there is decisions that need to be made about education and children, and that's just... And it's it. tough. That's Those the decisions. I'm in. Yeah. It's With tough. Kids in school and different things you've got. Roland, you had, you had your hand education. up? Yeah. Yeah, yeah um, I think the biggest thing is truth is being able to speak truth and be able to adhere to the truth even if it hurts us. Yeah. And being able to stand up and say, this is who I am. And we we're talking about this. My daughter went to the is going to the University of New Hampshire. The first thing that they did... You've got a daughter in college? Yeah. I'm a lot older than you might think I Oh, am. Roland, you're looking <laughs> great, buddy. They would have picked you. They would have picked you because you're young. My, you're... my son's here. My son's here. With me, he's 24. I said, yeah, okay. I thought he was your brother. <laughs> yep, no, he's my son. My wife hates it because I keep calling her my mom. <laughs> Careful, this is being taped, okay? <laughs> um, she knows it. <laughs> but uh, truth, you know, being able to go out and speak truth. My daughter's up there in college. When she got up there, the requirement for her to enter the college was she had to go to pronoun class first. She had to go to pronoun and learn the pronouns that she had to learn. And when they got back to her and they said, what are your pronouns? He says, she says, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are my pronouns. Wow. And she, they said, what else do you want to be called? She says, that's all I need to say. And she sat back down again. Mm. 
And see, it's those things that we've just mentioned here that is eroding the church. And if we as men don't stand up, and I mean, God bless the women in all of our churches. I think some of our churches would not exist today if it wasn't some of the praying moms and grandmoms. I'm here as a result of praying uh, older ladies in the Phillipsburg church. But it's time for us. And I know you guys are. That's why you're here. So I'm preaching to the choir. But we've got to solidify this with our other brothers that society will not change who we are. And uh, I'm not saying it's easy. Uh, here, here's the names here. On the left side are the Jewish names we just mentioned. And here are the Babylonian names. Now, I always like to find out the meanings. I'm sure you do. And we're not going to do a complete study here. We don't have the time this morning. But here's just some of what they mean. Daniel meant God is my judge. Hananiah is God is gracious. Mishael, uh, or Mishael, who is like God. And Azariah, God has helped. Those are great Jewish names. But look at the Babylonian names that the Babylonians were trying to change their identity. Belteshazzar meant, lady, protect the king. Maybe that's part... He's being emasculated. That verse I shared from Deuteronomy 23. He, he's, he's, he, his masculinity is being devalued into more of a feminist. He's, they want him to identify as a feminist. Uh, Shadrach, afraid of God. Afraid of God. Meshach, despised, contempt, who was like our God. And that's with purposeful small letter G. And Abednego. Slave of the god Nebo. And uh, that's an interesting study uh, of who Nebo was. And I'll just let you kind of uh, go do that on your own. But the enemy has a label for us that if we're not careful, it's going to be attached to us. And that label will inevitably... Take away what God has designed for our life. It defines who you are. What God wants to do is redeem us. Not rename us. He wants to redeem us. So we've got to know, guys, who we really are. And I love the season that we're in as a church. Uh, 20, 25 years ago, you'd attend this conference. You probably would have dress slacks on. And you probably have a, a shirt, maybe even a tie. Maybe a, uh, Society changes. L look at some of the old baseball pictures from like the 30s and 40s. Guys would go and just watch the game in suits and ties. What, what's the dress code now? Jeans. Some of us will go to church tomorrow. Church I attend when I'm not out speaking, I wear jeans. Got to tell you a little humorous story. I think I got time. Uh, back in January, I was called upon by a Mennonite church in our area whose pastor, uh, the board says, you just need to take your vacation times, you know, or you're going to lose them. And they, they, they forced him to take his vacation time, which was wonderful. Uh, and somehow somebody that I know knew the head of the deacon board. And so they called me on the phone and said, would you come and speak for us? Yada, yada, yeah. Uh, it was right outside of McConnellsburg, PA, if you know where McConnellsburg is, way down uh, the southern part. And, and I didn't know anything. All I knew was the church started at 1030. That's all I knew. And I just had to get up and give a word. Now, I wasn't going to go crazy with speaking in tongues and all of that. I, I knew where I was at. But there's so much in God's word I could preach otherwise. But it's a Mennonite church. Never guess how I dressed. Black pants black shoes, a black coat, and a white shirt. I took a tie with me because I rarely, unless it's a funeral, wear a tie in the last two, three, five years, okay? You know where I'm at? I walk in the door. I meet Steve, who's the head guy, and he's got blue jeans on and a flannel shirt. And other guys are coming in, flannel shirt and blue jeans, and, and uh, just down home, just great people. <laughs> And we get talking, and I said, Steve, I feel a little overdressed. He says, I guess so. If you ever come here again, please take that suit off, right? 
Well, they had me back in March, and I didn't wear a suit. I wore blue jeans and a, you know. But wherever I'm at, I, I try to kind of, you know, blend and honor what they're doing. But what a wonderful group of people. That some of them have small farms, and some of them just work in some industry. But man, Mennonites raising their hands, praising the Lord, hungry for God. And I said, their identity has not been changed. They moved out of the regular Mennonite group that they were in. They're still called Mennonites. But whatever they were associated with uh, had gone kind of woke, like you were saying, that they'd gone into some of the pink Mennonites and some of the LGBTQ, XRYZ, how many other letters they put on there. I looked up the pink Mennonites. It's a group out in the Midwest of homosexual Mennonites. I'd never heard of that. I'm learning stuff, guys. But how perverted. How in the world can we stand upon this? That's an abomination to God. And he says that. Yeah, we, we love. I, I led a, uh, my former neighbor when I lived in Altoona. I led him to the Lord. He's living with another man across the street from me. They were there for 15 years that I lived there. But it wasn't until about the 10th or the 12th year just being neighbors to them, helping them shovel their snow, do things, that they finally came to me and said, you know, we need to get back with God. They had been raised in the church. We've got to reflect God's word, but not the culture. And we don't have to apologize. I, I don't believe that we push it down their throats, but we've got to know who we are. There's so much gender confusion these days. So we've got to go fast here. Number two, culture will try to change our standards. If culture tries to change who we are and our identity, whether it's the church as a large or us, let me tell you, culture, we go verse by verse here, culture will strive to change our standards. Now, now look at this. It's, it's in... Uh, there's some good questions for you too, by the way. How much of the secular will we allow in our life? Should we examine this from time to time? And I think we should. Who are we listening to and what are we watching? All of that uh, is so vital. Uh, keep going. I'm glad you're in here, Tim. Uh, how, how long did you live in Phillipsburg? Oh, man, we were there for... He was the big star of the basketball team in high school, what have you. Wow. Be there for 15, it was a good church, good church, and it was some of the best days the church had under the leadership of his dad. Um, and he lost his dad just a couple months ago. Uh, rather tragic. But when I was raised in that church, Dave Wilkerson was the founding pastor before he went to Teen Challenge, if you know anything about Teen Challenge. And I've got a picture of Dave Wilkerson with, the, with a three-wheel car on my table out there that my dad helped go pick up in Lewistown. My dad wasn't saved, but he kept saying, Pastor Davey, what are you going to do with this car? And Davey ordered the car. It was a couple weeks or a couple months later that the car came in. My dad took him back down to Lewistown, picked it up, brought it home, and it was a three-wheel car with one door in the front. And he says to my dad, Walter, watch what we do. And Dave Wilkerson would make 15, 20 trips on a Sunday morning bringing kids into church because they had never seen a three-wheel car in Phillipsburg, let alone Pennsylvania. It was a, a German brand type of thing. And he drove that. It was a hook that he used to bring people in. He didn't reject culture. He was using culture to solidify the church. Then 10 years later, the, the cross and the switch blade, the big movie on Teen Challenge, premiered in Phillipsburg. And it wasn't his dad but there was a pastor there at that time that forbid us to go watch the movie. Can't do that. And that was in the days in the 60s when John Wayne and the cowboy movies and all this, you know, it's not the filth that you see in movies today. But we were forbidden to go to movies. You had to sign a little card for membership. You wouldn't go watch a movie. And we were forbidden to go watch The Cross and the Switchblade, a, a beautiful story. Uh, but me and my buddy, we snuck in anyway, and we saw it uh, and got vilified by my mom later on. But culture tries to change our standards. 
our values. Verse 8, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. <coughs> now, remember, how long is this going to be for? Three-year training period. But Daniel says, no, nope, I don't want to defile myself with any, any of this. And so he resolved in himself resolved not to defile himself. There's never been a time more important than right now that what we're currently living in to know what we really believe. And again, I think, Ben, you were the one that really hit on that. We've got to know that we know that we know. We've got to stand firm on what we know. Not that we're perfect. Not that we've got it all made. Please understand. There's so much I still do not understand. In my daily devotions, I'm still saying, wow, Lord, I've read that dozens of times, but it has a whole new meaning for me. When culture shifts, we've got to make sure that we affirm, reaffirm our convictions. I'm not saying that we've got to live in a specific time period or in a particular culture. Some people do that, and we, we respect that. The Amish, some Mennonites, live in, a, in the 19th and the 18th century still. Horse and buggy, you know, no telephones, you know, unless it's on the pole, and they climb the pole, and they can use it for their business. And, you know, they won't own or drive a vehicle, but they'll ride in yours if you'll take them to the store. Right? I mean, and we respect that, but come on, guys. We live in the world, but we're not of the world. Apostle Paul says we've got to be all things to all men so that we could just win some. So I, I love my brother here. He's, he's got a motorcycle out here. And I'd had motorcycles for all of my life until about two or three years ago. And what a hook when you pull up and there's other guys that maybe not saved. And hey, not that you preach at them, but boy, I had... Me and a couple of our board members, when we were in Alabama, we rode the, every year they have the Trail of Tear ride from oh, someplace in East Tennessee all the way out to Memphis, and it came down through Alabama, and, and we rode, and there's thousands of motorcycles, three wide, and you know, what a great opportunity we had, and we rubbed shoulders with, with some guys that were rather rough, rather rough. But, but when culture shifts, we've got to stay firm in our convictions. Now, quickly, we'll go to verse number 9. Now, God had brought Daniel into the favor and goodwill of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord the king who has appointed your food and drink. For why should he see your faces looking worse than the young men who are your age? then you would endanger my head before the king. He said, man, if I keep some of this food and, 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 and you don't look as good as the other guys, the king's going to have my head. He's going to deal with me. So verse 11, Daniel said to the steward whom the chief of the eunuchs had said over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days. This is what Daniel said. Just test us for 10 days. They're going into this three-year boot camp, but but... Here's the boot camp, really, 10 days. Just try us for 10 days. And if our appearance is examined before you and the appearance of the young men who eat the portion of the king's delicacies uh, as you see fit, so deal with your servants. So he consented with them in this manner and tested them for 10 days. So rather going through the whole lengthy thing and then the king having his head, he says, okay, Daniel, we'll go through this, 10 days. They'll eat the delicacies from the king's table, and then you eat what you believe your God would have you to eat. Um, that was kosher, okay? So what happens? I mean, this is a real test that, that's going on. Uh, they ate the vegetables. They, they had water to drink, and you'll see that in the, the, the next couple of verses. And the guy agrees, and they... After the 10 days, what happens? They look better than the guys who ate from the king's food. And let me tell you, the king's table was probably pretty good. 
Filet mignon, lobster, huh? Huh? Anybody like seafood? Yeah. I mean, the best of the best wine and everything else. But Daniel and the boys looked much better. Why? Because God's favor was on them, and they were not going to succumb to the culture. They were not going to really sin against God. They weren't going to make a big deal about it, but they said, just test it. Culture will test us. When I was in college, I worked for a fellow by the name of E.A. Farrell. He was the pastor at Calvary Assembly of God in Pottstown. Great guy. Big guy. Big as that door over there. Great. You know, E.A. And he had a side business because he was bivocational even back then. Church couldn't pay him. And he had a side business of carpet laying. So I got connected up with him when I first went to college through my home pastor, Walt Shell. So I got connected with EA, and I, I helped him lay carpet. I learned the trade, but I also then was his youth pastor on Wednesdays or Thursday nights, whatever it was, and then on Sundays. But me and EA, we, he was just teaching me so much, and I, I worked for him with almost the four years I was in college. But there was a guy about the second, maybe my third year, it was my junior year in college, that one of the guys uh, that worked at Sears, and we were a contractor for Sears, did a lot of the new homes they were building in the Pottstown area. Uh, we subcontracted and did their work. But one of the assistant supervisors, who was Muslim, Mohammed, Rashid, I think Mohammed, something like that, he, he would always come out, talk to us, what have you. And then one day he, he came out and talking to me. And he's just, he's just about five or six years older than I am. And he says, are you really a Christian? Yeah, I, I believe the Bible. He says, I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let you know that I'm not. He says, I've never met a real Christian yet. I said, Rashid, come on. He says, I thought he was going to have one of those gotcha verses, you know, that, you know, he was going to look, and I'm just a Bible school student, you know, and he's a couple years older than me, but I thought he was going to have a gotcha verse, and I'm thinking, oh, dear Jesus, he's going to get me. And you know what he does? He comes up to me, and he says, I've never seen a real Christian. Bam! He smacks me in the face. I said, what's the deal, Rashid? He says, if you're a real Christian, you'll turn the other cheek. I said, is this the way you go around trying to find Christians? He says, well, I want to know if you're... I didn't think he was going to hit me the second time, and he did. The other one. Bam! Not as hard, but he hit me. I said, Rashid, if this is the way you're trying to find out who's Christians, it's not a good one. He says, well, I've never had anyone receive it like you have. You're a real Christian, pointing at me. Let me tell you, culture will test you. I wanted to... <laughs> that's a test guys all right and culture is going to give us those tests and those opportunities all right the point is that we should not try to push our point or to uh, uh, push someone else into our way the goal is to win them for jesus the goal is to show them Christ's love. As I said, be all things to all men so that in some ways you can win some. In John chapter 8, it says the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. The Son of the only God. And his, we beheld His glory. The glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. We need both of those. And notice, grace comes first, then truth. Okay? And we've got to connect that. Grace without truth is meaningless. Truth is what sets us free. So truth without grace is, is mean. Grace without truth is meaningless. John chapter 8. We won't go into the story, but it talks about the woman at the well. Uh, not, not the well, excuse me, the, the woman who had been caught in adultery. You know, and all the guys were out there and Jesus writes in the sand. And you've, you've heard your pastors or, or leaders talk about, you know, what did they write. And 
All I know is that Jesus showed that woman grace. Where's your accusers? Because they all fled with whatever he wrote. And some believe that he perhaps was writing the names of, of the ones these guys were having affairs with. And, and, and how about this? And I'm sure you've heard this. This isn't anything new. How did they know she, that they caught her in the act of adultery? Were they peeping toms? What, what was the deal with that? So Jesus just writes and, and he tells her what? Go and sin no more. Grace is, where are your accusers? He offers, offers her grace and love. And then the truth is, if you go, go and don't get involved with that again. What forgiveness. What forgiveness. Let's just bow our heads before we leave this room today. Grace invites us to be free, gentlemen. It's the bottom line. Grace involves us to be free. And the truth of his word sets us free. Heavenly Father, we want to receive your grace today. My brothers that have come and taking a whole Saturday, Lord, I, I pray that they'll glean something from this day that will help them in their lives. Lord, I pray that I will receive. Already I've received in that first service, Lord. You spoke to my heart through Pastor Brad's message. Lord, I need your grace. I need your love. But Lord, allow your truth to set me free. Guys, if there's something you just need to ask the Lord forgiveness of, right now is the time. Just say, Lord, please forgive me of this or that. I don't need to know. I don't need to see your hand raised. You don't even have to acknowledge anything. But right now, let's each one of us, before the heavenly throne right now, say, Father God, I'm sorry about this. I'm sorry about what happened this week. I, I was short with my wife or some of my family members. My business dealings. God, I'm sorry. Please forgive me. He loves you, gentlemen. He is not even motivated by what we do for him. He's motivated by what he's done through us. And he wants to do so much more. Pastor Brad was so right on in the early service when he, he said that even though we may be retired, there's still something for us to do and those of us who are retired, we, we hopefully get that. Some of you men are working in, in difficult situations. As Tim said today, Lord, help him in the school system. Lord, that, that guy that's here that's in the industry, Lord, a salesman or, or working in the shop, help us, God. That culture will not eradicate, emasculate, or do away with what we know is your truth. Lord, may we, as we stand before you one day, stand as men that have stood upon biblical foundations. In Jesus' name, amen. The Mentor Guy's final thought. What a great word for the men. Walt did such an amazing job with this sensitive topic, and I'm so happy we could bring it to you this week. Well, guys, we don't have time for this week's podcast. Just a reminder, the Forged by His Fire Men's Conference is this weekend, October 14th and 15th. Men, you do not want to miss this conference. It's going to be amazing. Make sure that you're at Camp Hill, PA for the Forged in His Fire Conference on October 14th and 15th. If you still want more information about this, visit forgedbyhisfire.men. That's forgedbyhisfire.men. And when you attend the conference, make sure to stop by the Mantor Ministries table and say hi. But guys, as we wrap up today, I want to thank you for giving your time today to listen. We'd love if you took a second and shared this podcast to your social media accounts. We'd love to be able to reach even more men and help them grow in their walk with God. 
Don't forget, subscribe, give a five-star rating and review wherever you get your podcasts. The more reviews and ratings we get, the more men can find us, the more men we can help grow spiritually. Also, don't forget to visit MantorMinistries.com to learn more about our conferences, our books, and our resources. But guys, we do appreciate you giving us your time this week. Thank you so much for joining us. And we'll see you next time on the Mantor Guy Podcast. Thanks for listening to the Mantor Guy Podcast. Be sure to visit MantorMinistries.com to learn more about our books, men's ministry resources, and our Mantor conferences. Hey guys, the Mantor Guy, Jamie Holden here. You know, I'd love to come share at your church, at your men's ministry, at your ma- next men's event, or men's breakfast. I have a challenging word for God's men to help them become the men that God has called them to be. If you'd like to have me come share with your group, visit MantorMinistries.com to contact me about coming to challenge and encourage your church's men to grow in their walk with God. Guys, did you know you can watch all the sessions from the 2022 Ignition Mantor Conferences for free? Whether you watch them on your own or use them in your church's men's ministry, they are available to view on our Mantor Ministries YouTube channel as well as at MantorMinistries.com slash 2022 conference videos. Check out these session videos as well as the session videos for past mentors for free. They are great resources to help you grow in your walk with God. So take advantage of these free conference sessions today. Guys, have you liked and followed Mantor Ministries on Facebook? If not, this is the perfect time to do it. We really stepped up our social media game to bring you content Monday through Thursday throughout the year. You can watch short video clips from the Mantors, be inspired by quote images, and stay informed of everything happening at Mantor Ministries simply by liking and following us on Facebook. So take time today, go to Facebook and search for Mantor Ministries and like and follow us. Do it today, guys. The Mantor Guy Podcast, helping men grow in their walk with God.